I'll begin. Hello and welcome everyone to the Be Waste Wise webinar of the month. As most of you all know, I'm a Kangsha Singh. I'm the community builder at uh, Be Waste Wise. Be uh, uh, Waste Wise uh, is a non-profit organization and we have been bridging this uh, waste solutions expertise gap worldwide uh, since uh, 2013. Uh, we've been organizing such waste dialogues on a monthly basis, uh, addressing the need for uh, knowledge dissemination on waste management issues around the globe. Um, if you see the value in making such uh, diverse sustainability dialogues uh, such as these available uh, free of charge to anyone and everyone, then we request you all to support us in this mission. Um, uh, we encourage you all to please uh, check out our website and donate. Uh, we'll be sharing the link for the donation page as well in the chat. Now, moving on to the topic of uh, this particular webinar today, we will be evaluating how to fully embrace uh, the potential of carbon and waste reduction through better management of food and food waste. And additionally, we will understand from the panel how tackling food waste is a key for a wide range of sectors, and that include various uh, sectors like retail, schools, and hospitality. And uh, they'll be discussing insights from the highly successful uh, Love Food, Hate Waste, and Zero Waste Week campaigns. To moderate this webinar, we have with us Emma Berlo. Uh, Emma has been moderating our webinars for many years now, and she's a very familiar face on our uh, platform now. Uh, she's UK's uh, UK, uh, leading uh, specialist uh, on the circular economy and sustainability in business. And she's worked directly with businesses on sustainability for more than 20 years, 25 years now. And she founded Lighthouse Sustainability in 2020 to deliver impactful advice, coaching and training. Emma today will moderate this webinar and explore with the panel what we have learned till date, what is a good practice, how we can maximize the outcomes for this type of work. And to share these insights we have on our panel today, Heidi Spurrell, she's a founder of uh, Future Green. And we have Mark Roberts, he's a senior specialist at RAP. Uh, before we uh, move on to this discussion, I would like to make a few announcements. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and we will be uploading this on our website and our YouTube channel. Uh, please use the Q&A function for all your queries uh, to the panel and we encourage maximum queries from you all uh, to function for anything that you want to share uh, with respect to your insights, your views, your comments, or your research, or anything related to the topic you want to discuss, you can uh, use that uh, function uh, to your convenience. Uh, back to the panel and over to you, Emma. Oh, thank you so much, Akanksha. That's fantastic. Um, thank you to everyone for joining, and we will get started as quickly as possible. Um, as Akanksha said, please use the Q&A function. We will be answering your questions as much as we will, you know, talking to the panellists here today. So I'm not going to waste any further time. I just want to dive, you know, sort of straight in. Um, I'm going to ask you to sort of a little bit of an introduction to what you do, but really I want to know, Mark, I'm going to come to you, your knowledge of behaviour change. Why do we waste so much food? Uh, thanks, Emma. So yeah, I'm uh, Mark Roberts. I'm a senior specialist at Rap in Behaviour Change. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, who Rap are, Rap are a uh, global NGO working uh, across systems to change the way we buy, use, and dispose of of products. And one of the big things that we work on is is food. Um, within that, we we have a citizen facing campaign, Love Food, Hate Waste, that you'll see the logo behind me. Um, but also we work directly with governments, uh, providing insights that that support um, su support shifts in and reductions in food waste um, across the system. And we convene partners through our Cortol 2030 agreement, um, working with retailers, uh, manufacturers, uh, and the supply chain to to reduce food waste um, within the supply chain, but also. Uh, for households um it's a it's a good and i guess there's no simple answer million dollar um, question it, to, to, ha to why we waste so much food food waste is a symptom essentially of um of a system wow. um both in terms of a system uh, the wider system but also the the system in place in our household as well so it, it 
food waste occurs in every household pretty much without us ever wanting to waste food we don't set out to waste food but there are lots of interacting behaviors that that mean that we that if we don't get right means that we do waste food mm -hmm. so um wrap break it down into kind of a, a few different chunks of behaviors so you've got uh pre-shop planning the actual shop itself storage and then cooking and using and eating and then disposal finally but even within those there are numerous behaviors um and to change to change one doesn't necessarily resolve all of the issues um equally in the way that we that the supply chain and the the um and retailers are kind of set up means that mm. uh, it doesn't necessarily um create an environment for us to to waste mm. less food yeah so it sounds like a design fault so we've designed a system uh that maybe was uh you know designed around convenience certainly around cost and and not so much around avoiding food waste which we'll come on to a little bit of history about it later which certainly wasn't the case in you know my parents generation where if anything the system was a, a designed around reducing you know minimizing waste Thanks, Mark. Heidi, can I come to you? Because I know you work in industry, across hospitality, restaurants, um, hotels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll pose the same question to you and, and tell us a bit about what you do. You know, why do we waste so much food in the environments you work in? Thanks, Emma. Thanks for having me here. Um, so as you've already said, um, we're Future Green and we're a boutique food sustainability consultancy and a proud registered B Corp. So if for those of you who don't know, uh, it, it, we, we stand for being a purpose-led business um we're based in hong kong right now with an office soon to be open in amsterdam so that's very exciting but um as emma mentioned in a nutshell we help food service we help the food service sector retailers caterers any business that is transitioning to sustainable practices um who sell and serve food and we do it through stakeholder engagement so team alignment workshops problem solving workshops through this kind of design thinking approach and um, with the idea that we might help them design a sustainable sustainability plan or a strategy, let's say. So that's sort of the big picture stuff. Um, and it, what we do is not just food waste. So whilst food waste is absolutely critical for mitigating climate change, there's all the other issues, as you're very well aware of, you know, all the sourcing of the packaging, the seafood, the sourcing of sustainable uh, high welfare poultry, dry goods and all the rest of it. So we try to keep that systems food systems approach in mind um, and of course of course food waste is absolutely up there um, but on your question on why we waste so much you talked about history so absolutely mm -hmm. mark mentioned about systems uh, the systems uh, the system we live in today doesn't really help um, us to focus on that not wasting food mm -hmm. um, so i uh, you know as you said historically um we never used to waste this much, right? Post-war, 40 to 50% our disposable income was spent on food. Nowadays, it's averaging 12, 20, and maybe 30%. I have to be careful yeah. what I say because of the cost of living crisis. But, yeah. you know, historically, we, you know, we spent so much more of our disposable income on, um, on food. And so we valued it more. Um, there's also the issue of food subsidies, right? So on the policy side, mm -hmm. we, we subsidize massively and not, not necessarily the foods that we should be eating more of, right? We, we subsidize for yields, for calories. We don't subsidize for regenerative agriculture. We don't subsidize for optimal health. We don't wow. sub subsidize for the long term. And so if you think about all of these other issues, mm. they all come into play together in the system. So that's a bit of a long winded. No, I really, uh, that's really useful. So both of you have instantly, what I love about that conversation, because you've instantly shifted what is sometimes seen as a consumer issue, which understandably consumer behavior plays a part, but actually is more of a systems issue and a design issue. And I just want to sort of dig a little bit more into that history and, and maybe get a reflection from both of you. How has food waste changed? In, in the time that you've been working, you know, in this field, let's say that, let's say the last decade, you know, are we winning? I mean, Mark, you've, you're the campaign that I don't know how old Love Food Hate Waste is, but it's probably a decade old now, isn't it? Uh, even, even longer now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, 
rap have data going back to i think 2007 or around that um and can compare that data oh, to, to 20 years. Mm. yeah so can compare that data to around about to, to 2021 and i think we're, we're working on a, on an update um coming later this year mm. uh, and I guess in the first, in the initial three years, so between 2007 and 2010, um, with the introduction of kind of live food hate waste and the work that we'd started with, with kind of retailers, um, we did see a 20% decrease in food, in household food waste. Wow. Um, and that, I'm not saying that, so love food hate waste was a, was a part of that story, but during that, mm. during that time, other things also happened. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, food prices were on the rise uh, and incomes were negatively impacted by kind of the 2008 financial crisis. Yeah, crop. I was going to say around so, that time. Yeah. So those factors combined with kind of a, a new focus on food waste, um, where okay. kind of love food hate waste came in and, and helped with tools and tricks to reduce the kind of food that you waste, we kind of saw that level of, of impact. Mm -hmm. that, that has kind of stabilized now so between mm -hmm. 2014 and 2021 we haven't seen the kind of same level of decrease in, in fact it's kind of stayed stayed rel relatively stable mm -hmm. um over that time um and so i guess really um we're we need to go bigger mm. and and quicker uh, especially if we're to meet kind of SDG 12.3 goals and in the UK kind of halving food waste by 2030 um we're gonna we're gonna need to go a lot a lot a lot bigger a lot a lot faster um mm. than we have done in in kind of previous years good okay so let's let's in this we've only really got an hour together but let's dig into that a little bit more more mark because I'm sure people listening would like to know well look how do we go bigger you know how do we actually get into people's mindsets and, and you know Heidi from your point of view what have you seen as the change in the industry sort of are our hospitality businesses more interested in now in in reducing their food waste than they were say 10 years ago so I would say we've had some wins here specifically in Hong Kong because we finally passed a law on right. food waste okay um, this year has been a bit of a significant year so the food waste issue and then the plastics packaging issue so that's okay. kind of come but it's come after decades of NGOs pushing for it um I mean your question on awareness of course they're aware but the question is what are they doing about it unless mm. enforced unless that you know regulation or unless it's going to cost them um I would say not much because you're bringing an issue to yourself more work for you and this leads back to the behavior change, right? The incentives, what are those incentives to help businesses to really make meaningful change? Um, there's a lot of education that still needs to happen here. And I'll just give you a very quick story. Um, when I spoke to one of my students, um, he works in FMCG, and he was explaining how when he went to visit a uh, facility where they um, upcycle, I think it was recycling actually, um, the, the, the sorters were picking out um, plastic that they could uh, recycle rather mm -hmm. than plastic that they could not recycle right okay. and so it's normally the other way around right typically you know you're just taking things out oh this won't work this work because the majority ah. of the things you know are good enough 80 percent right conveyor belt but where we're at in hong kong is it's the opposite you're picking out things that can be recycled so can you that gives you a real right Wow. where we are in this city in terms of okay. fairness. Um, so I think it's quite telling, if, if I'm honest, of where we sit in terms of our journey in sustainability in this yeah, city. Yeah, really interesting. And that's why I invited, you know, you guys from different parts of the world, because I want to see, you know, a different perspective um, from, di from, you know, different parts of the globe. And I know people on the call will be from all over. So please pose your questions, you know, to the panel from the countries that you're in. You know, what is it, what is lacking? Uh, Heidi was just saying, you know, a piece of legislation has been passed and that's hopefully changed things. Uh, Mark says we've been sort of, you know, trying to um, push these narratives for, for a long time now, and we've kind of plateaued. So I'm really interested to see, you know, how we kind of reach the aspirations that, that we want to reach. Um, so without going too much into the sort of policy context, because that's you know a bit heavy for everybody, but Mark, I just wanted you to talk about the voluntary agreements, because that's something you're working on that's got global, um, you know, reach, hasn't it? 
Yeah, so our voluntary agreements, we, we support food-based voluntary agreements in, I think, eight different um, eight different countries. Okay. Um, and that includes kind of um, our kind of flagship one, Quarter 2030 in the UK, um, but also we're working with we're voluntary agreements in Australia, Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa, and the US. Um, but kind of, I guess, going, going, going kind of a, a step back in terms of RAP's Quarter 2030 mm. work, I guess, in the UK particularly, um, policy has been large, largely kind of um, followed kind of a, a voluntary approach. So led by Love Food Hate Waste and also Quarter 2030. Um, and in terms of kind of Love Food Hate Waste and the impact of, of that's been having, um, it's food waste is now um, in most people's top three food related concerns. Okay. Um, so it's it's high up on kind of consumer concern, mm. um, and coupled with the work that supermarkets and food manufacturers have been doing, particularly on things like um, display entails and sell by dates, uh, which now thankfully in the UK are kind of a thing of the past. Um, yeah. So that that resulted in people using those as essentially used by dates. Um, and not fully understanding the meaning of them. So removing them meant that more people are able to kind of eat eat beyond those dates. And, and more recently, some of our work with um, expiry dates um, is, is, is having an effect. But I think generally around kind of policy around the world um, could be a lot more ambitious. Very mixed, um, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, we we, we could look at other materials as as as... Um, inspiration so packaging and electronics where we, where you know in the uk we're now introducing producer responsibility um so it, as you were saying earlier it's moving that focus away from citizens mm. Mm. Uh, and the consumer to actually it's the the whole supply chain that have got a, well and the charity sector i guess as well yeah. i mean kai says here in bahrain there are no there's no legislation for reducing food waste all activities are either done by voluntary or charity organizations so i guess it is one of these things that's seen as a kind of nice to have nice to do i just wondered in either region if you're seeing um any action around this because of climate targets because of you know the carbon associated with food waste because that's to me the elephant in the room yeah i mean you know i think one of the stats that rap rap talk about is um that if food waste was a a country it'd be the third biggest global uh emission of, of climate mm. of um cause of climate change so um global emissions so it absolutely has a huge part to play in in reducing uh, yeah. reducing our impact um and i think you know, especially the the retailer and, and brands that we work with in the uk under understand that but i think mm. Link, what heidi was saying earlier is that there's a kind of in the same way that individuals have trouble changing their own behavior right this have trouble changing behavior yeah um, yeah, yeah. As, as do policy makers i guess we sort of get stuck on a track yeah lots of competing demands um you know primary goals being kind of like actually meeting their stake their stakeholders and and boards kind of needs uh in terms of, kind of mm. generation as well it, and and sometimes you know um mm. reducing food waste isn't isn't as high a priority as no. some of those other those other aspects and again kind of links to that need for for ambitious policy potentially mm, yeah great Heidi in your work with businesses are you seeing you know a greater awareness of net zero and carbon reduction leading to a greater awareness of actually there's a lot of uh, carbon emissions locked up in our food waste that we could potentially reduce is that something that you're hearing yet yes for those big businesses, those businesses that have to report. So, you know, Hong Kong's a finance city, anything that relates to ESG reporting on a compulsory level, those big, let's say like the landlord developers who have their F&B tenants, mm. they're making efforts to work with their tenants on this. Um, I would say it's mostly at the at the biggest level of where, yeah. you know, the larger companies for sure. Um, because here in Hong Kong, we have a lot of little small cafes and 
it's been the norm for many years to use this thin disposable plastic on every single table. I mean, that's how it is, right? And then you know, putting your waste on on um on the table, roll, wrapping it up. You know, I'm talking about oh. like really old fashioned cafes. Oh right. And you just wrap it up and throw it away. And, and that is quite common in you know um I would say in the northern territories where they have a lot of small traditional cafes. Yeah. So trying to change that up is really hard, and that's why. Mm -hmm. You absolutely yes you need that regulation but unless it's enforced unless you've got support um that's nothing's going to happen right and when i say yeah. support I, I hear stories about people going because the the charge waste charge was not, not just affecting businesses it was um uh, citizens as well uh, at a residential level and people were looking on taobao which is a website um for kind of copycat bin bags to see if they were cheaper so it's still not like it you know, yeah. we need support. People have other priorities going on. Um, and that's why I love what RAP's doing around behavior change, behavior science, because the, I've seen a lot of wins in that space, like using nudging, not telling yeah. people what to do, uh, under the radar sort of, you know, experiments. Um, one particular example I can share is a canteen where they were able to reduce the food waste by 44% in 12 weeks in a canteen setting just through nudges and I thought wow this is 44 because, yeah which is huge wow. massive so yeah this is without massive policy change this is without huge costs. Just nudges mm. just these little subtle changes and um it's great and those are the kind of examples you have to kick off with like okay it's not going to cost me any money maybe I'll run this project and then but that's a massive change right I mean even you know you could do quite a lot and still get like a 10 percent change at 44 percent um, yeah. And there's a lot of cost associated with that, clearly. Absolutely. And um, even if you tell the businesses, you know, there's evidence you can save between six and eight percent on your bottom line if you actually manage your waste. Yeah. Um, it, it's it doesn't seem to be enough to get the change mm. happening. So well, as Mark was, say, was, yeah, Mark was saying, it was. Yeah. Mark was saying we're very driven. We're very driven by the next sale. We're more driven by the next sale than we are driven by the cost reduction. Although. You know, years and years of sustainability. I, 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 I've, you know, heard so many times, but there's cost reduction, there's cost reduction, but it, it still isn't the sort of leading thing. Um, I'm going to go to a quick poll now, if if Akanksha can uh, put the poll up for us, because it, it wraps up this kind of first part of of the of the uh, conversation. What are the key ingredients? This is for you, the audience, to um to take part. What are the key ingredients? Do you think for successful food waste reduction? Very broad question. But we've had a couple of comments in the chat about reuse options. So Oleo has been mentioned. Um, too Good To Go is, is here. Uh, Mark has mentioned consumer uh, action in, in the labelling, you know, changes in the labelling, uh, which I don't know if, if it's been taken up globally, Mark, or is that just a UK thing with the um, with the change from expiry dates? And I, I, think, it's, I think it's a largely a UK, a yeah. UK thing, but um, it's... it's is likely something one of those interventions that is likely transferable to to many other markets oh 100 percent. yeah that'd be great um and you know heidi you were saying about nudges which i presume some of those in include things like menu planning is that something that you talk yeah. to yeah yeah absolutely um menu planning so there were three nudges in this case well one was oh. the um the uh, transparent bin bags with the daily weighing so oh i love that people yeah will, like you couldn't get away from it you couldn't escape it you saw it every day in front of you if you use the canteen so transparent the bin bags that's the takeaway from this this <laughs> webinar definitely there was the uh, portion so physical portion examples so i could go to purchase my food and i knew what the portion size was okay right. um and then the other one was education so at the yeah. table you had your uh, posters and things like so you just couldn't really Wow, that love that. that. This yeah. canteen is on a mission to do something about food waste. And yeah. I think portions are really important. Yeah. Okay, great. So th thank you. That chimes in really well with our poll. Uh, so 47% of people said consumer education. So you mentioned that Heidi is one of the nudges on the table, information. Um, second after that was promotion of campaigns. So I guess that speaks to your uh, work, Mark, that you do around love, food, hate, waste um and yeah you know it sounds to me like it needs to be a mixture of tools and sort of one thing's not going to solve it 
Um, interestingly, people feel like access to composting is also important here. Um, and you mentioned the um, menu planning there, Heidi. So um, I'll just share the results with, with everybody. Um, so Paul, you were asking about this examples of nudging behavior. So Heidi's given us a couple there. Heidi, did you just want to say something more about the portion control? Because that's not something I'm I'm familiar with. What, what, how would you advise a, an organization on that uh, catering? Um, testing, really. I think you're going to have to test because there also is still this big sense of what could I get for my money? You know, like that kind of American bottomless um, drinks, bottomless refills, all that kind of stuff. So you have to be very careful that you don't um, reduce. But just talking about emissions, um, yeah. we've seen experiments with reducing the meat, the red meat on the portion um, in certain dishes and mixing it like burgers, mixing mushroom with beef, yeah. all those kind of things really work well. Um, and also how you bring people into your canteen space, like in terms of putting plant-based foods at the beginning of a canteen, yeah. having meat at the end, um, you know, having demonstrations of portion sizes, I think is important. Because if you think about it, I'm five foot three, I eat much less than my six foot two husband, right? So why, why is wow. there options? I'm not saying it's, it's a sexist thing, but <laughs> physical reality is that someone like me couldn't eat as much as someone as you know as much yeah. older than me so why don't we have these options so i think absolutely yeah small, you know regular whatever yeah that, you know, it's that a really good so, point again it comes back to behavior science yeah right? it's using that kind of very subtle um there's a book by um mitchy called behavior change will and it's been used a lot for interventions i really love that Oh, brilliant. Yeah, so if you're able to, you know, when you get a minute, Heidi, pop a, pop a link in the chat, that, that would be great. Um, uh, Chepo uh, has just put a comment in about hospital food waste. So we'll take a little diversion into that. So um, Chepo and I met, uh, he's come on a carbon literacy course that we've run. So it's really great to see him again here. So he says oh, his uh, hospital generates a lot of food waste. So uh, Chepo's in South Africa, a thousand kilos a week. Okay. Um, one of the primary sources from experience is that patient preferences and dietary restrictions. And dietitians are doing their best to ensure the meals are served to patients in accordance with the standards. Obviously, you were saying, Heidi, the number of calories, the nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. However, some of the patients just can't eat the meals. So what methods can we adopt to limit or minimize the food waste? Are there any best practices? I wondered if you'd, any of you'd come across that in a sort of institutional setting. And I'm also thinking of not just hospitals, but you know, there's all sorts, isn't there? Schools and uh, prisons and, and, and um, you know, uh, any environment where people are sort of regularly being fed, military, whatever. Have, Mark, have you got any experience in those sort of settings? It's not as random as the consumer home, maybe. Um, maybe not as random as consumer home, mm -hmm. but certainly with some big challenges, I think. Huge. Um, yeah. so we, have, we haven't directly worked um not recently anyway as far as i'm aware it, with with either hospitals or, or prisons uh, i've done some work with schools but they they come with very unique and substantial challenges um you're saying about kind of the kind of the the system which operates trying to get people the the food that they they need to recover um but that personal preference element being actually very strong um particularly um then you layer in the fact that actually you know you can have visitors and they can bring in the the food that you'd actually much prefer to right <laughs> to eat as well so um i think thinking through all of the all of the challenges we you i think the the approach to that that i've taken to kind of trying to tackle the situation without any kind of obvious answers is to is to is to look at something like um you the use of a behavior change behavior change wheel or something like mm. me and try and diagnose the problem as best mm. you can. So, um that might involve lots of uh, lots of pieces of research with with um with with those that prepare and serve meals with yeah. doctors but with the patients themselves um to really get under the skin of why why that's why that's happening and and portion it out into um mm into the sections that behavior change we all suggest which are around opportunity motivation and and kind of capability um mm. so um uh, i i suspect the answer isn't going to be uh, One a, a thing, no. one, mm. um for sure and but i, I think research is going to 
it's a kind of a, a, a decent pro program of research both quantitative mm -hmm. and qualitative will will shed light on the causes of that and then how you can kind of then design interventions to, to tackle it yeah it sounds to me like there's really scope there for uh, sort of best practice you know in an industry to be shared and um, it, in our carbon literacy training, when we talk about food in the workplace, we use an, a case study from the University of Cambridge. So, Charlotte, I don't know if you're there, but if you're able to pop um, a link onto that. And, and they they went down the nudge route as well, more plant based um, options um, and were able to shift quite a lot of people towards a more plant based diet without any kind of feeling of you know, being forced down a certain road. And, and the feedback they got from people was that actually we wanted to reduce the amount of meat we ate because um, of health reasons or, you know, just wanted more choice or whatever, whatever. So there was quite a lot of benefits and they didn't lose any commercial income uh, to that. And they did a very big study across, you know, um, uh, thousands and thousands of meals. So on the sort of scale that you're, you're talking about. I'm just going to pick up on what Oliver's said in the Q&A um uh, an organization called refuse in northeast england runs a schools program addressing food waste in the kitchen and the canteen and working with pupils they've managed a 25 percent decrease decrease in food waste the biggest impact is sitting and chatting with the children providing information and getting them to try food before throwing it away um and he's uh, put a, a video link in there so that's great so that sort of chimes with what you said mark which is about actually ask the people who are eating the food and similarly heidi you know ask people if they want different portion sizes do they want this or that and then you've got the evidence then because i think sometimes we feel like we're guessing right we could change things but we're sort of guessing what people want um uh, like kai's also mentioned here about they were researching about 15 years ago food printing uh printing the right size of potato uh with uh, i assume mashed potato to avoid waste in elderly homes so instead of that sort of huge dollop from a spoon you actually sort of you know get portion control right uh, so there, it sounds to me like there are some ways and there are you know some good practices but we're maybe not sharing them particularly well um yeah great okay um i might just add on your go ahead uh, heidi yeah your school's data, um, we work with a catering company here and um, they told us that the schools, they get better results working with schools than working with their corporate clients. Oh. Like, the kids are much more willing to experiment, you know, as opposed to the banks and the corporates who are just too busy in their day. So that was a real insight for me. And I just wanted to tell you the rice story because we work with yeah. a quick service restaurant Please. and they told us that they try to um, reduce the amount of uh, rice that was thrown away. But the problem was the messaging that, you know, it was like free rice refills was the positioning and it really shouldn't have been that. <laughs> it should have been, you know, just naturally giving smaller, smaller bowls because we want to manage food waste. So small reducing the portion size and mm -hmm. then saying you can get a refill. So the messaging was wrong. And so they had to just stop that because one of your questions was about what can go wrong. And I think the messaging is so important because this could have worked, but then they gave up. So just, mm. you know, to Mark's point, you've got to get the right research done. Otherwise you give up too quickly. There's already a lack of trust when you're trying to persuade your employees and teams to change the way they work. Mm. Um, so to not get it right, fail, and then try to get them to do it again, it's really hard because a lot of these jobs, they're in long, they're doing long hours. You know, they are not necessarily getting, you know, a high pay for what they do not at the beginning anyway so you know it, it, you have to sort of look at the human that's helping to implement the um the changes um, yeah not just the science and the data i think yeah that's absolutely brilliant and uh paul said here he wants to know more about nudge i love nudge behavior i think it goes a lot across a lot of sustainability particularly where people are you know topics emotive they don't want to feel like they're being told what to do and we see this a lot around you know, plant-based food and the National Trust in the UK, which is a sort of bit of a um, national, you know, uh, uh, national treasure, if you like, um, are looking to increase plant-based food. And whilst this webinar isn't about plant-based versus meat, that, that does mean that the carbon footprint is obviously reduced if there is waste. Um, and yeah, you know, there's been a bit of a hoo-ha around it. 
Um, but they're really, really looking to sort of get to 50%. It's not sort of like a 90%, 100 And yet people immediately feel, um, you know, like they're being told what to eat and to sort of control things. So I think the messaging, you're absolutely right, Heidi. Um, I think I'd be tempted to just do it and not tell anybody, but that's that's sort of <laughs> the way I am. Uh, if, you know, as long as there's choice for everybody. <laughs> As long as there's choice. Well, I don't remember being told ever what percentage of meat was on the menu. And yet somehow now I need to be told what percentage of is plant based. So we've sort of gone a little bit too far down that road. But anyway, and that's my that's my opinion, maybe, Mark. Uh, just coming in on that, I think I think such an important thing that we haven't discussed yet is actually the, the role of the defaults. It's, it, it's yeah. kind of what you were linking to there. Is, is, right. You know, um, so rap um rapper working on unpacking fruit and veg mm. um as one of our big things saving tons okay. of plastic waste and saving food waste at the time because it enables people to buy what buy they want they rather than yeah they what they want. instead of buying four apples you can buy six mm. um or other way around instead of buying <laughs> yeah. six apples you're buying four um so the role of i think the role of the thoughts has has such a big parts of pl part to play in, in changing the way that we buy use and dispose at uh, the um by by selling fruit and veg loose for example you can go and buy what you what you what you need but um so that 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 takes a huge amount of work from the the retailers to change a, a system that they've been working on for decades yeah. in how we provide the service to to the customers and kind of the, the way that customers are are usually shop now um but that also links to what you were saying Heidi about messaging there's no there's no value in changing um changing that default to um to but to buying to buying loose if people don't understand the benefits of buying loose or don't understand how to um to to establish what the right amount is for their yes. house um so you kind of need uh, mm. the role of nudging goes alongside system changes and education and, yeah. the, and education and it's actually about the the round it's about yeah. um making sure that for every behavior that we're trying to change that there is um that there is the opportunity to do it that yeah. um, everybody has the skills and the knowledge to engage with it yeah and and has the motivation they know that what you know they know what the benefit of doing it to is and and mm. usually when it comes to the way we buy use and dispose of stuff it's what's the benefit to me uh, yeah. and, and okay. i don't think in the in the environmental sector we've mm. not been good at at, at, at describing that um, no we've we what, focused very much on the negatives of the food waste and you're you know it's a bad thing it's a bad person i've seen that mike my, my, i've got two teenage boys and uh and and say they cook pasta or something you either get a sort of mouse size portion or you get enough for about 15 people, you know, because I, you know, I haven't trained them well enough to know that, you know, it's about this much waste per person or this much pasta per person or whatever. And of course my eldest got big appetite. So he doesn't believe me anyway. So he puts in three times as much, you know, so I can just see that in people's minds, you know, we're learning by trial and error all the time. I don't know how much I'll need. So I'll just buy two and you know what it's like. Um, I just wanted to touch on a, on a question here from uh, about bog off. So uh, buy one, get one free in uh, is something that's common in, in Europe. Oh, but other promotions as well. I've you know, seen it when I've traveled in Europe. Um, so can we, you know, can we, what, what leverage have we got to persuade supermarkets, for example, away from those sorts of messages that you're talking about, Mark, which is presumably where a lot of the waste comes from. It's it's a really important thing. So um, earlier I described kind of the many phases that we go through in terms of the way we buy, use, dispose food and store it. Um, but broadly, we break that down into two, into further two, just to make it just to make yeah. it simpler. <laughs> and it's 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 buy what you need and eat what you buy. Um, buy what you need and eat what you buy. Love yeah. that. Yeah. And so anything that encourages to encourage us to buy more than we need um isn't helpful in reducing food waste and and bog offs can be and and multi-buy offers that kind of you know you often see on on a lot yeah. of um fruit and veg actually which is a, a large portion of the, the food we waste um where where you've got kind of three 
three uh, three for two offers, and it's um, and it is encouraging it us to to buy more than we more than we need, um, and it's definitely something that Iraq we've identified as 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 a, an area of kind of future focus, um, mm-hmm. and LinkedIn links in really well with our focus on kind of um, uh, reducing kind of uh, or encouraging more people to buy lease. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah, thank you. I think, I just add to that. Um, I think it's a little bit, um, we just have to be careful when we say buy what you need, what you buy, because obviously if you are in places where you have food deserts and people can't get access to fresh food very quickly, we just need to be careful. Um, maybe it's like kind of the, the concept chimes well with West wealthy, let, let's say, you know, developed countries, mm. but not so much for I mean, even in the States or a, every part of lots of parts of the world, you have places where you just can't access fresh food. So mm-hmm. um, those yeah. those are places where there, there are going to be challenges with just shopping um, in small amounts. Um, but just wanted to give you a restaurant example. Yeah. Um, when I was living in um, uh, in Amsterdam in, in the Netherlands, some restaurants, because we have a massive problem with buffets here in terms of um, what's happening in the restaurant space and waste from buffets. Okay. Um, some restaurants were charging for food that you didn't eat. So you'd, oh. pay your, you'd pay for your buffet. And then if you take something that you end up not uh. eating, you'd be charged for it. And I thought that was brilliant that that's a really good way to go wow i've never heard of that that's fantastic so maybe we should all try that like encourage restaurants to try that yeah so interesting you mentioned buffets and i had a meal out in chinatown in london uh, a week ago and a lot of those have gone to buffets and we didn't we actually had a sit down kind of meal but um there's a question here from vishnu um and it's it's a really good one because i hadn't thought about it at all are there any, any initiatives taken with online platforms um, that you order food from so that the ubers and just eats and that sort of thing and again you know probably um a, a only relevant in in certain regions but vishnu's saying the food waste is very big and obviously this is a new model of buying food i live rurally so thankfully they can't reach me but i'm sure if they did my kids would be using them to order food you know so it's this convenience thing it almost you know on steroids isn't it the fact that you can just ring and a burger will appear at your door i just wondered both of you because you've got you know different perspectives from around the globe are we potentially going into a sort of food waste nightmare with with uh you know very easy to access takeaway food it's it's become a lot easier to get hold of hasn't it so although kind of particularly in the uk with the cost of living crisis and inflation it's become more expensive to get hold yes. of yes and and it's not convenient but it's become a lot more, more, more convenient but it's a whole new channel isn't it it, it is you know? absolutely there's a whole there's a whole new channel not only can you buy takeaways through um through some of these delivery services you can get food delivered from your local kind of convenience store um so yes. it not not only is as Heidi was saying about portion sizes uh, and things like that important when you're looking at kind of food delivery um there's there's a displacement going on as well that actually mm. it's, it's become a lot easier for you to look in your fridge and go you know what I just don't fancy I just don't fancy what's in there today mm. um I'm going to order a takeaway or I'm going to get this delivered from my local convenience store so not only is there kind of um a, an issue around kind of portion sizes and over ordering there's a displacement of food in the home already because your yes taste buds are tingling and you're saying you know i could eat those leftovers from last night or i could just order a big mac you know that's that's really sort of messing with our control mechanisms a little bit isn't it heidi yeah yeah, I was just thinking it, it sort of links. It's like a first world problem, right? With oh, massive. Do I really feel like it? Do I feel like having massive. my left or do I really feel like getting you know something else? But going back to online platforms, what we saw, we've seen in Hong Kong, um, some platforms were trying to reduce um, cutlery waste. So I don't know if you have that in the UK where you could check a box and say, okay, I don't need cutlery because if you are delivering to home, why would you need cutlery? Oh. Um, yeah. But I would also assume if you're delivering to home, it's easy to, um, yeah, to save your food because it's already in a box and mm, yeah, you can put it away. But I, I totally get Mark's point on desirability. Um, we have to factor that in. But again, it's 
getting to the root cause, isn't it? It's like, how much do we need to order in the first place? Like getting back to that top of that waste triangle and saying, and, and yeah, what are we doing to prevent and, the waste happening? In the first yeah, place? Which and, comes back to the behavior piece. Yeah, Mark. yeah. And it goes, and it goes back to buying what you buying closer to your needs that actually, if you're somebody who is often tempted and goes with that temptation of ordering takeaways, just buy just by four days worth of food as opposed to seven days or you know it, it comes to that kind of planning part of that, planning, that yeah. buying, buying i'm line. not sure we're great planners as as a species this is the the issue and and i think i was just looking in here in the chat and joe joe said to your point about eat eat what you need she said eat what you have not what you fancy so that in itself is kind of a uh putting us back into the kind of people feeling like well I fancy this I should be allowed it um but it sort of brings us back to where we started and um in terms of you know what should we do we've we've sort of said it would be great if we did more nudge and I just don't get the feeling there's enough drive uh, on, from the policy side um from this and I'm just interested in, in the last few minutes that we've got is what you think the metric should be because you know in my to my knowledge not mark we've always talked about tons of food waste avoided that sort of thing obviously we're now able to carbon footprint some of that where do you see this going you know is this a waste issue is it a carbon issue is it both you know what metrics are driving this conversation um it's it's absolutely both right um but i think if we're if we're focusing on food waste uh we have to we have to measure how much is being wasted. We have to, that has to be the primary thing that we, that we focus on. But having said that, we also need that, that kind of gives us the, okay, what's happened, but we also need to understand the detail, the why is the, how we change behavior. So we need to do the qualitative research. We need to do the, the consumer research. We need to research with retailers and, and manufacturers and processors. And we need to, we need to evaluate so we it you know it's so important that we evaluate because then we understand what's worked why it's worked whether there's any mm. um whether there's any uh kind of negative impacts that we weren't expecting or anticipating it means that we can then share that knowledge with the world um mm. and help reduce kind of food waste that way and i think um so it's it's essentially measure a lot is mm. and 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 every every intervention that we that we that we need to budget in there to to evaluate so that we can really learn from the experience Get better at measuring it yeah. so it's yeah. a little bit out of sight out of mind isn't it and you know Heidi mentioned the clear bin bag I, I sometimes say, you know, the inventor of the black bin bag has got a lot to answer for because once it's in there, it's gone. Now, I know some countries are moving away from, you know, um, biodegradable waste going to landfill. Uh, and obviously food waste is not a good thing to incinerate either because it's very wet. So it's not helpful to the energy from waste um, uh, world. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm wondering, uh, Heidi, in other countries, whether you're seeing that across Asia, is there, a, is there a move to try and keep biodegradable waste out of landfill at all? Is that the, um, the driver? I would say um, just anything, diversion to land, um, from landfill is good, but I, I'm not, especially in Hong Kong, I don't see a lot yeah. of it, like the composting, recycling, yeah. prevention to landfill, I'm not seeing it. So we are starting going back to basics just right. not even talking about compostables um, and if you think about if we're talking about households there's barely any space to mm -hmm. some households don't even have a kitchen why yeah. would, on earth would they even consider having a composting yeah right? so interesting we have one of the highest rates of eating out of home figures in the world um so i i think restaurants eating out caterers they have a lot to yeah do well, in terms of mm -hmm. supporting um supporting citizens in terms of that space. yeah interesting and you know there's been a couple of questions here about reuse and recycling joe says what impact do you think food waste recycling has on the amount of waste i suspect it may actually increase the waste as people see it as a sort of magic yeah. answer so sort of guilt-free waste if you like i mean i know people do say that all the time oh well i'll just chuck it in the compost you know i'll just chuck it in the food waste mm -hmm. so it's almost like i'm solving you know my conscience a little bit because i've over ordered um 
we should recycle food waste obviously it's got really high high value high nutritional value um as long as those facilities kind of exist um just to come in on, on that yeah point. on the recycling so, side yeah on the recycling side so we um obviously in the u in the uk we're in the process of moving to simpler recycling and part of that is yes every household having a a separate food waste collection um that that they can put their their food waste in our research so far actually shows that there is a there's a um food waste reduction uh that results from having a food waste collection okay um, great so the research that we've done suggests that it's um it's likely being driven by salience which is the the kind of point you were making earlier that your food waste becomes a lot more um salient to you you're much so more, more conscious of it, of it. So much, much more conscious yeah. of it because you see it you're separating it out um and you're seeing that as 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 waste and subconsciously you're you're then making steps to reduce that food waste um yeah. it what we don't know is whether that is sustained over time and whether okay. it needs support. But uh, one of the areas that RAP is is exploring at the moment is how we how we can kind of maximise that prevention effect of the rollout of these separate food waste collections that are coming yeah. over the next you know five years or so. Yeah. Um, and we've recently re uh, published some reports on on this, so I'll I'll find those and. And yeah please do um absolutely because i think a lot of people are asking for links um uh, oliver's asking for a multiplier for helping convert tons of food waste to carbon but if any of you have got a quick a quick view on that sort of how do people start to sort of make these these calculations it's really important i think once you do realize the value in carbon and and suddenly you know you've got a net zero target that can be you know really valuable as well and nicola says she lives in buckinghamshire um, and we do have weekly food waste, but still people put food waste in the black bin bag. Uh, more education is needed. So it sounds like a lot of work to do, guys. <laughs> and, uh, you know, fascinating, Heidi, to hear, you know, the difference um, between Hong Kong and the UK, but obviously the difference between all these countries. I mean, we've had comments from Australia here. We've had comments from South, South Africa. Um, so it's obviously very you know unique to the to the situation um just before we go you know just to wrap up what what's been learned really what what sort of key takeaways would you want to leave with people who are you know wanting to reduce food waste in their own organization and Heidi what are your key messages I guess um I think if I had to choose um you know focus on the human right ultimately you are working with people so really figure out how to motivate and incentivize them to really act on the change and do something about it. This isn't just about as much as, you know, data and science and the numbers and the mm. things that are, are important. Get inside the head of the people that you work with. I didn't um, tell the story, but um, just very quickly, um, when this business that I worked with put a machine, uh, an aerobic adjust digester in, you know, like the waste separation, food separation machine, and the staff did not want to know anything about it. But once they realized it meant they didn't have to carry out waste up the stairs and out into, you know, that set them off and they started getting very competitive about it. So just get inside the human brain, understand how you can motivate, yeah. incentivize, reward, because, you know, it, it's not exactly a sexy subject, let's be honest. Um, and then number two, it's already been said, like measure, monitor, set goals. Um, right. And yeah, people set goals. And I would say like partnerships, like you need partnerships, work with mm. really great organizations. You've got lots of them around. Yeah. Um, and then maybe finally leadership. If without the leadership, it's really hard to get things moving. Mm. Just don't focus on businesses to find results, which is what is kind of what's happening in Hong Kong. It's very kind of let's leave it to business. So we need more right. leadership, more policy. Yeah, I guess you have to have the intention, right? So, you know, it's all very well to measure and to manage and da da da, da but you, you you need to have that intention from the top. And it's kind of like, okay, we are going to tackle this. You know, we recognize we've got a problem and we've got to tackle it. Um, and whether you can convert that into, you know, kilos of waste, as Tepo was saying, or uh, carbon, I think that really helps get a handle on it. I definitely think there's something here from working in hundreds of businesses. The waste is always out the back. It's always out of sight, out of mind. And if you were to, and I've never done this in a food business, but I've done it in other businesses, actually leave it for a week and let it pile up. You know, um, it's often shocking. 
But the fact is it's been collected and it's gone, so no one cares. So I think there's something here about, um, yes, measuring it, but but really sort of having a bit of a shock about <laughs> what are we doing? Uh, you know, so sitting with it. Mark, what's your key takeaway? What are your key uh, recommendations? Um, kind of building on what Heidi was saying, I think um, when we're thinking about interventions across the system, across it, policymakers, retailers, brands, citizens, is that we are we are making sure that those interventions cover off that they have the opportunity to make that change. They um, have the skills and knowledge to do it and the motivation. So every actor is is motivated to do it, has the skills, has the opportunity. Um, and then, as Heidi was saying, measure measure and measure so that we know what's what's working uh or if something hasn't worked why it hasn't worked so that we can um can change and repeat and go again uh, and, find, and find the answers yeah great so that's brilliant thank you guys and thank you for sharing so much of your knowledge hopefully people can keep in touch can uh, often ask you know other questions thank you for sharing some of the links um you know i think with all these things is trying to keep it simple for people um, trying to do stuff that sticks so that nudge behavior you don't even know you're doing it it kind of like sticks and really importantly I think it's important to share so I've heard you know just in this one hour so much rich information that we need to share more um, so yeah I would encourage anybody listening if you're going to be working on this go public with it you know even if it's just your journey on LinkedIn because people are all on this similar sort of challenges similar journeys you know connect with other people here um, and let's see what we can do. You know, maybe we've got we've got some uh, maybe we can move some rocks out of the way. Just this this group that have been here today. So thank you, everyone. That hour's gone quickly, as usual. Um, you can catch the download on um, on YouTube um, and obviously carry on the conversation, probably on LinkedIn. Um, but thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Akanksha. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, for Emma, for everyone for joining in. And thank you to all the attendees for sharing all the insights on the chat. We can see they have been sharing a lot of examples and initiatives that have been happening in the region. So thank you all for that. As uh, Emma mentioned, this uh, recording of the webinar will be available on our YouTube and our website soon. And if you like to stay updated, then please subscribe to our uh, newsletter and follow us on social media. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Emma, for this. You're welcome. See you again. Good day to all. Bye, everyone.